Hello. So our model for SIR had uh, fallen apart in class at the end of class today. And um, so I want to make sure that I have um, the model working uh, correctly for you. Um, and so, and since I'm going to be missing a few days, um, we're going to do a, a little code along here. Um, but first of all, I had messed up Euler's method in the code. Okay. Um, so when we look at Euler's method, this says we'll get a new y value from the previous y value plus this will be the rate at which y is changing with respect to x. So this is a rate of change times an amount, this is our step size. Now this whole last term right here is really delta y. Now the reason it works is if I'm at a point, so let me just uh, draw a quick graph here, and I'm at a point, and let's say dy dx is that is has a slope that looks like that, and we step over a distance step size of delta x. If we multiply that delta x by dy dx, we'll get delta y. The ratio of delta y to delta x in the picture will match the dy dx value right at the point we're looking at, and then that will tell us where to put our next point. Okay, now at that next point, uh, we'll probably have a different slope value. Um, so maybe the slope looks like that at the next point. And so then when we make our next step, um, we'll go over delta x again, and this time we'll go up further and we'll end up somewhere over there. So this steps us point by point. Um, we know that if we make small delta x's, uh, you know, small step sizes, um, we'll get a pretty smooth curve. If we make large step sizes, the curve will be chunky. All right. Um, now in our problem, instead of y, um, this was, we were looking at s's, i's, and r's. Um, so let's just say we were doing this, you know, instead of y, we have i of n is equal to the previous i, okay, um, plus, and then this should be, um, we, we need to have a delta i, and delta i should be based on di dt, which I've been calling di, but then we need to multiply that by delta t. So to get the delta i value, I have to take the di dt and multiply by delta t. Okay, so I never did that in the code, all right? So right now in the code, we have something that looks like I of IT equals I of IT minus one, since we can't use subscripts, okay, plus DI. Um, the DI calculation though in the line above should have been multiplied by the time step. So let's go back to the code and fix that problem. That's problem number one. So let me stop this share and let me screen share my MATLAB screen. Okay, um, and when we ran the code, we, we had ridiculous results. This was supposed to be the susceptible population, um, which ended up growing um, as opposed to shrinking. All right, so where did we make that error? Okay, right here is where we were calculating the change in S. So to get the change in S, we need to take all of this. This would be ds dt and multiply times the time step. And then the same thing down here when we multiply it found the change in I. What I have highlighted here would be di dt. I need to put all of that in parentheses and then multiply that by the size of the time step. Okay, so that will help. All right, now in this case, oh, we can see our susceptible population instantly um, got better. Okay, well, there are two reasons it got better. First of all, um, we, I made my time step much smaller than it had been. 
So actually, I'm just going to scroll through the code in case you missed any of it. You can pause and make sure your code matches what I have here. Um, oh, and the other, I'll talk about Tmax in a moment as well. Okay, so um, my Tmax and my DT are different than what we have done in class. Right? Um, those were the initializing the values. Nothing has changed there. Okay, and the calculations. And you'll notice in the calculations, so the big change is right here. I had to multiply by the time step in order to get the change in S. And the same thing down here, to get the change in I, I had to multiply by the time step, okay? Um, R will just, is still found just by taking the total population and subtracting the S and the I values. So that will work um, anyway. So there we have it, okay? Now, Another thing that occurred um, that caused error before was um, we had this DT at one and Tmax was at 52. So let's see what happens when we do that. Notice we still get a spike, all right? What happens is the minimum S value, if I type min of capital S, you can see it's very negative number, right? Um, the reason why that's very negative is because we, we had a dropping susceptible population, but our time steps were so big that the value went negative. And then once S goes negative, these equations um, just get out of whack um, because we start multiplying by negatives when we shouldn't have any negatives in there. So a way we can fix that is we could cap, we could prevent S from going negative. If S of it is less than zero, that means it's negative, okay? Then I'll put a semicolon. So this is sort of a new line of code, but I'm gonna do it on one line. Semicolon means it's a new command, a new line of code. I'm going to assign it zero if it's less than zero. And then I will end. So I actually did three lines of code in one. Since it, each line was so simple, it's just a little bit more compact to do three lines in one. So if S goes below zero, we'll just reset it to zero and end that. Let's see what happens here in the graph. Suddenly it looks a lot better, okay? So S was never allowed to go negative. So that is another fix, okay? Um, it means um, since our time steps are discrete, they're not, it's not a continuous flow. Um, the susceptible population actually could drop below zero unless we cap it, all right? Um, just for the sake of argument, let's just do the same thing with I, okay? If I of IT is less than zero, semicolon, then we'll let I of IT equal zero. Since that's going up, I of IT is, is gonna grow for a while. And I don't think it ever drops back to zero. Um, this is probably not going to cause troubles, but if it's dropping rapidly and we have time steps that aren't small enough, um, it is possible that I would go negative, all right? So those two commands will prevent this line right here. And this line right here will prevent any part of the population from going negative, right? Another thing you can see, um, my figure, isn't very interesting because the susceptible population drops off very quickly. Okay, remember the time is in weeks. Uh, we'll label things in a moment, um, but it looks like by 10 weeks, all of the interesting stuff has happened. So let's go out to 10 weeks instead, right? Looks better, but the graph is very chunky. If we're only gonna use 10 weeks, MATLAB has a huge computational ability, so why not make really small time steps. We'll make our time steps hundreds of weeks. And you can see how that smoothed out the curve. Okay, and we get very different results as well um, when we make our time steps smaller. Let's see what happens if we make them smaller yet. Okay, notice that didn't change the curve so much. So when we're stepping by the week, um, one week at a time, the results are, are not very good at all. But if we step by a thousandth of a week at a time, um, we get pretty smooth results. So 
All the interesting stuff happens before 10 weeks. So we just adjust our window and make really small time steps because MATLAB can handle it. All right, so Euler's method is better um, when we take more small steps. So why not take advantage of MATLAB here? All right. So we now have all the values in, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and improve our plot, okay? So we plot it T and S, okay? Um, so that plot um, looks like it's in blue. We'll leave that as blue. But we're going to want to plot the other values, S, I, and R, all right? So I'm going to go down to the dot, dot, dot means I'm continuing this line of code. So the plot statement is just going to continue. So now we're going to plot T versus I. And let's do that in, um, let's do that as a red. So the negative sign means a line and let's do it in red. Um, red is a good color for infected. All right, so um, let's do that. And then let's do the recovered population. And let's do that in, uh, we'll do that in green. Okay, so if we plot, we should now see all three populations. All right, and that's kind of interesting. You can see um, the infected or the susceptible population drops off as the infections go up. Um, but over time, those infections decay away as people recover. Um, and so by the end, everyone's in the recovered group. All right. Um, and that is interesting. Out to about 10 weeks, you can see the infections dropped off to nearly zero. Okay. We have this huge spike. Um, and remember, we're looking at the entire population of the US. Um, and there's a reason we have this huge spike. Right. We only started with one infected person. Um, but we assumed that they were um, infecting about seven people per week, and it was only taking three days for each in, uh, person who gets exposed to quickly become infectious. And so we can see by um, that we're, we're really growing uh, rapidly, exponentially here, okay? Um, in fact, the constant that we have Okay, the R1 constant, if I type down in the command window, what is R1? Whoops, R1, not RI, is um, 16, okay? And so if we were to take E to the 16th power, it's a little bigger than 16 actually, um, E to the 16th power, that's kind of what we're gonna have after one week of growth, um, is going to be a huge number, that's 8 million, okay? Um, so within a week, um, with that transmission rate, um, we are going to have a lot of people getting infected, okay? So this is probably a little bit unrealistic um, for how many people are going to get infected per week. So I'm gonna bring that transmission rate down to two. And you can see if I run the simulation again, um, it's going to take about five weeks for this to run wild across the country. Okay, instead of two weeks. Um, so that's probably a little bit more realistic. Um, we could make it take longer um, for people who have been exposed um, to get infected. If we bump that up, you can see that's pushing things out a little bit. Okay, um, so I'll use those numbers instead. Um, and we can see how that, how that affected the data. Now, when I did that, um, it pushes things out further. So let's go up to 15 weeks for our time. And we can see within 15 weeks, uh, this has really, this wave has passed us by. Um, so the susceptible population has basically all gotten sick and recovered um, within 15 weeks. All right, so, um, there you have it, that works a lot better. Now let's make the graph a lot prettier. Okay, so this is plotting the result. Um, so we should have, first of all, title. The title of the graph is gonna be a string, okay. Um, S, I, I'll say, and R versus 
and don't want to spell them all out. So I'll just put that in there. Okay. So if I run that now, you can see there's a nice title up there. All right. Um, I want to put access labels on here. So X label will be, I put, have to put that apostrophe to make it a string time, make the time capital and put the units of time in parentheses. Okay, so if I run now, you can see there's a label on the x-axis. Um, we can put in a y label. All right, and this will be, um, oh, let's see, um, amount or number, number of people. If we said spell out number of people, we don't need uh, units on that. Okay, so if I run it again, you can see number of people that are in each category um, there. Okay, um, now a final thing that I want to put in, I'm going to put in a legend. Okay, um, and down here, let's do a little help legend and see what happens. Oh, it tells me what I can do. Okay, so if I want to create a legend, Okay, um, let's see, what does it say? Wow, there's a lot of information that comes up. I can put in the labels, okay, um, for the legend. Okay, so let's do legend SIR and see what happens. Yes. I R. Okay, and let's run this and see what happens here. Look at that, it put a legend in my graph. So it tells me which color is which line, okay? Um, now I think I can put a location on the legend. Let's see, um, yes, okay. So if I say comma, location, see how the legend got a little bit in the way. If I want it to be less in the way, um, I can put it in the east. And it's just like a map. If I say east, the legend is right on the east part of the graph. Um, you can actually do things like um, northeast. And that puts it back up in the upper corner. Um, if I wanted it to be uh, northwest, you'll see that would move it to the other side. Whoops, with one T. Okay, I can move that legend around. Um, and it doesn't look very good there. I'm going to put it back in the east. I think in the east works very nicely. Uh, the only thing I might want to still do is um, put in some grids. So let's do grid on and grid minor. And now when we graph it, uh, it just helps us to see where the values are um, a little bit better. Okay. Um, and you have tools that you can use if you want to find values. Um, you can use your pointer. And if you point around the graph, it will allow you to find values, you can zoom in. So if you want to see what values are, like maybe where is the top of this infection curve, I can zoom in a couple of times on it. And I can see that the infections peak right around 1.85, I could say. Um, so that would be a good way to find the value. And if I hit the little home up here on the figure, it goes back to the way that it was. Okay, so that should give you enough information to plot the video. Let me once more just scroll slowly through the code. You can pause if you need any part of this.